if you have a machine, well, you need a machine. If you don't have a machine, I'll probably post the link after this. So if you want to follow along at home when you have the video, it will work. Um, I want the keys back. So let me see. You have not, no, it was such a hip thing you have to Pass it along. Just so basically on, on the, the key, there are two directories. Well, there's a big OVA file. And there's also a presentation software. And you're going to want to copy both of those. Data on what the actual house numbers are 
by cross-referencing these humans or supposed humans. So not only have they got this data, they've now got a human annotated data set. They can now um, recognize this stuff better than humans. <coughs> There's a thing about image classification. Basically, we've got here, this is a container ship, this is a leopard, this is stuff which machines can just look at these images and tell you what they are. So Google has got this in, say, their Photos app, whereby it will automatically label what's in your photos. Same with Facebook, same with all the major supplies, I'm sure. They can also generate like detailed captions. So over here, over here you've got someone on a motorbike, um, two dogs or playing a game. So you've got this thing where this, the machine can actually just spew out captions of, of which like, explain what it sees in the pictures, as well as just having a single link. We've also heard about reinforcement learning, where it's been applied to AlphaCo. So actually I've got, um, in the workshop folder or the repo, I've got stuff which addresses all of these things. But we're just going to go from the very basics today, um, all the way to something kind of interesting. The basic thing about neural networks is, is been, the field is fairly unchanged fundamentally since the 1980s, in that you've basically got very simple units computing very simple functions. But when you combine huge numbers of them, you get something much more complex. So here is a single neuron. And what we have here at the bottom, if you look on it, inputs. So this would be the features. That it could be the values of a pixel, or it could be the value of the temperature and you know, humidity. This could be various different inputs. These are then added together with weights. And then from here, we then put them through this kind of non-linear function to get this output. Now this non-linear function is just, if it's more than zero, keep it. If it's less than zero, it's zero. So you would think you can't do very much with this. And that's true. So we'll have a little look about what you can do with this and why making these things, joining these things together, makes a difference. So basically, you will then move on to multi-layer, neural network. This has got the same kind of inputs at the beginning. Translated through each of these things, this one has got weights to all of the other inputs. Same with this one. But these weights will all be different. Similarly, this unit has now got connections only to the ones in the layer before. So the final output is a combination of the layers before that. So basically, each of these is a very, very simple function. This sum stuff, weighted sum, maximum of zero. So we've only got something very, very simple. How can you actually make this turn into something useful? So what, what we can now do is go to the first of the things that you'll find, <coughs> which will be this TensorFlow features and training. And basically, if you've, got, if you've got this stuff on your machine already, um, you'll find it in the presentation folder. You should, you should easily find something like this. And then you can click on this TensorFlow thing. Is everyone following me here? Has someone not got a USB key yet? Are we all done with the USB keys? Okay. If you haven't got a USB key, this is actually something which Google put up um, on the web. It's called uh, the TensorFlow Playground, so you can just find this anywhere. The reason I got this on the USB key is in case, the, well, last year the uh, FOSS Asia Wi-Fi was terrible. So everything on the key, this doesn't need an internet connection. So if you click on this, basically, we get to this kind of page. Um, does anyone fail to get to this kind of page? Or if you do, I'm going to move on quickly. So, And it's already set up so that we can look at set, what this page is, is it's a, a neural network playground. And what the task we're trying to do is, is to, to look at this um, over here, this is a set of, I'm going to call them orange dots and blue dots. And these orange dots and blue dots, the idea is we want to create something which will separate them and predict which regions are orange and which are blue. 
Now what we're doing, what we have to play with here is just something which tells you how lefty and righty it is and how up and down it is. These are the only two features we want. So we're only allowing two features here. So if we combine these two features, the only thing we can get is basically we can do any diagonal line. Okay? So if you click this train button, basically this will say, I know I've got some, some weights from this one to, from to my output from this feature, and I've got another weight from this feature to this to the output. I'm going to adjust these weights until I make these regions as good as possible. So we can, we can restart this. Well, let's start again. It's actually completely the wrong round. So what happens here is we've got, it actually chosen the weights at random the wrong way around. So when, when it picks one of these, these blue dots and says, okay, I think it should be orange, you say, well, I got that wrong. Why did I get that wrong? Well, I paid probably too much attention to this feature here. So you can then start to say, well, if I pay too much attention, I should be changing this weight. So I, I know with how to, which weights to blame for getting this wrong. So at every stage, if this is, if this is colored wrong, I then feed back to these weights to adjust it. So I prefer this, I, I don't want that feature, and I do want this other feature. And what gradually, what will happen, actually fairly quickly, is that this will then train into for, to categorizing this properly. So this is, this is a very simple blame game. Basically, we're trying to categorize all of these things in the blue region, all of these things in the orange region. And if it gets getting it wrong, it tries to demerit the feature which it, which told it the, gave it the wrong hint and increase it for the ones which worked. Okay. Now this is fine until we say, okay, let's classify this. Now this, this one, if we just restart. So this one is like a quadrant and then we've got like a checkerboard. And the question is, what is the best line which separates these two? Because all we can do with two features and two weights is generate a line. So if you try to do this, basically, it's not going to do anything. There is no way you can separate this checkerboard with a single line. So here's where you say, well, what I really should do is have some kind of a hidden units. And this will then say, let's just start with two. So if I add a layer in the middle, these hidden units can now produce a single line. And this can produce a single line. This will be a combination of two lines. So that may be something where it could figure something out. So it's beginning to get the idea. Now in fact it can't possibly it can't do this in reality because this is a parity problem. But basically it's been able to say, well I've got the lower bit which I'll ignore, but I'll fix up the other bit. So this is where it's using two lines to try and do something. Equally, we could, we could try this again, we could turn it there. <coughs> Add some more lines. So here, by essentially by um, just putting the right blame and deciding who to, what features to use, you can then cement this thing by using this hidden layer in the middle. So that works well, but let's try something else. So this is a, a ring around a circle. So if we just rethink this and we try again. So it's had to work a bit harder, but basically if we now look at what it's doing is when it's looking at these orange pieces, it's gonna say, I love the stuff around this area, and the stuff which has given me the wrong idea, which could be there, I'm going to have a demerit against that one. But because of these demerits on the weights passed back here, this would say, well, I wouldn't have got that demerit had I not been given the wrong information by my previous level. So at each level, they, they get not only has the weight change going to them, but also how bad the information they got how well they contributed to the whole outcome was. So this enables each of these things to then have its own demerit system. So this is how the error is being back propagated through the network. So the signal is getting forward propagated through the network, but because of this whole fitting and error and the blame game essentially on every weight, you can then pass back 
the demerits to the common network. So this is what the backpropagation learning is. You can, this is a fundamental thing, so it's not clear whether this will work. It probably won't work. Um, this is basically what, you, what this kind of network can do. And it's kind of to illustrate how not only can you vary the features, because there are other features you can use, you can also create features which could be useful. This is the idea. So th this is just to get the idea of features and the ability to generate these internal features. So basically, so things to answer. So what, what hopefully what we've run. Basically, the goal here is to do some supervised learning. We're trying to learn to predict what the inputs mean in terms of here is blue and orange. We can also choose which input features we're going to use. We can see what a single look neuron learns, which is hardly anything. We see how this blame, blame game is played, which is the backpropagation. And then how the neural networks, that blame game actually will create internal features which are useful for making this work. Those are, the, those are the takeaways from this. So let's talk about something where um, deep networks have had some success. This is image classification. So um, through the ends of the 2000s, basically there are lots of um, like open CV would be a classic image recognition or image processing kind of library, and people would detect. They would have lots of different features that they would look for. So if you're trying to detect, I'm not sure about, if you're trying to detect a cat, you might have build a specialized fur detector, you might build a specialized eye detector. This is, you basically, you build an arsenal of features, and you combine them to make the best possible detector. What happened is in 2012, and since then, the deep learning people, basically, instead of having hand-picked features designed by humans, they just said, basically, we should let the whole, that the outputs drive back to the features that we want, and let the machine determine every feature that we're going to put into this. So since then, and this is one of the things which suddenly made deep learning a huge a huge deal, is that deep learning just basically took over these com those competitions. So in order to understand what's going on with a um, with these image things, is that instead of doing the um, orange and blue dots thing, Basically, we're looking at the whole image. And this was normally considered, or previously considered, something which humans were good at, but machines could never be good at. Um, because it's just so fuzzy what, what is in the image. But one of the nice things about images is they're actually organized. So you've got the whole idea of up, down, left, right, um, so that the actual pixels are related to each other. Like the pixel one above is closer than the one elsewhere in the image. You've also got the idea that the cat could be anywhere in the image. Basically, images have some organization compared to just x1, x2, x3. So the idea for this, what is now called CNN, so this is a different, a slightly different kind of neural network, but it's all the same principle, is to use the whole image as being our feature. And the parameters that we're going to twiddle are basically the little, um, the elements of a Photoshop filter. So you can, you know, Photoshop filters, you can have a sharpen, you can have a blur, Basically, it takes around, well, I guess that. The mathematical term for these Photoshop filters would be convolutional filter or convolutional kernel. Um, a CNN is a convolutional neural network. So basically, the idea of a CNN filter is you have this little matrix. You have, here's your input image. And here's a little matrix. And I'm going to pass this matrix and just add this stuff up and multiply to produce an output image. So the purpose of this is this: the these numbers are the parameters of my convolutional filter, or the, the layer. So in this, the parameters here, just translating one image into another image. And what we can do in order to see that more carefully, actually clearly, we can have a play with a convolutional filter, which is one of this. So here is something which hopefully you've got. It's also available on the web, just I made it last night. So here is a simple thing where we have, this is our input image, and you can play with this on your own machine. This is our output image. And basically, if I start to change some of these parameters, 
So this is a three by three convolutional layer. This is one convolutional layer. So I can just change the numbers. So you can see that by, by changing these things, I'm going to emphasize different pieces of the image. Either I can start to make it lefty-righty, I can look at edges, I can make it blurred, I can make it sharp. But basically, I'm not going to want, it's not my job to make this happen, because I can let the neural network play the blame game on what features it wants to have as its input. So, going back to the presentation, Here is the idea of a CNN, the, the workflow which is going on in a big CNN. So basically it is our input image. And then the first convolutional layer is basically a whole series of images which are, I'm not sure they're using the eyes yet, which are basically the car with different filters applied. And then what you can do is you then put this nonlinearity after it. Then you do the same again. So you're going to say, okay, let's put another layer. Let's represent the fuzzed up version with a sharpened version. So you, I'm not sure whether you played with you know, Photoshop, but if you if you blur an image and sharpen it, it's not the same image. So you can imagine if you've got a, a righty image and a lefty image and a lefty image, and then you combine them, you can start producing many more different kinds of images. And you might be able to start highlighting different elements. So if you look at this in detail, or you look at some of these pictures which you can find online, basically you'll start here with just kind of outlines and vertical lines and um, different aspects of like pixels. But as you start to get over here, you start to pick out shapes. So some of these layers will be very responsive to circles, which will be car wheels. If you start to train on a whole bunch of cars, it will start to pick out features which are useful for recognizing cars, and it will do this purely automatically. So just to complete the flow, basically you'll take all of these image pictures, and there's also these things called pooling layers. Basically, it's a squashing operation. So you take your whole image, you just do a 2x reduction. So basically at the end of it, you get some rather small images, which are saying, basically saying, well, there's a wheel in this, and there's a headlight in this, and there's sun in this. But so to be, but the, I, I can't necessarily explain what terms there will be. It doesn't tell you. All it will be able to say is, in order to predict this is a car, which is the output I'm trying to strive to, I would like there to be wheels and headlights and sun, or, or whatever it is. So. By construction, the only thing, the only oh, right. weights I'm allowing it to do is applying this filter. So it's not that I'm allowing each pixel to reflect every pixel. Right. It's that filter with its nine weights. Okay. So you're giving that then, and then it's, it. it has no other option. So this is the right. okay. So, it, but typically you'll have not just one filter. So you would never have just one filter. You'd have 64 filters or something, because you want it to have a, a, a whole palette of different things, and then you then. This is, this is actually a three-plane thing, because it's got three color channels. This would then be a 16 color, essentially a 16 color image. This would then be another 16 color image. So you force that restriction because right. you know that there's translation. Be, 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 because we want to keep the, we like the translation invariance idea, and we know that eyes do kind of something like this, so we're going to exploit that. So now let's explain why why this has been so successful. Um, basically, there are competitions to do this, and this ImageNet competition is a big deal in image processing land. Um, it has 15 million labeled images, 22,000 categories. Basically, people are playing a game to win this thing. So it could be Google playing it, it could be Microsoft Research playing it. Um, we'll get to that. Um, basically, it's now turned into, that since the whole deep learning thing, is, is, I guess this is only still a four-year-old kind of issue, 
Um, people are pouring money into winning this, this game, um, which is a good thing, because it's advancing the state of the art extremely quickly. So the game, the essential game here is to take this image, and this is, this is a visualization by a guy called Carpathy, who's from Stanford, is now working at OpenAI. Um, this is a picture of a hot dog. Um, here are the, each strip of these are different classes which could represent of the stuff which is in the ImageNet database. So going across here, difficult to see what they are. Okay. Going across here will be one kind of dish, then there'll be another, but there'll be hot dogs, and there'll be hamburgers, there'll be whatever. Um, these images are extremely varied. They're just taken from like Flickr. Some, and they're hand-labeled by humans, basically hired like a mechanical Turk. So we've got a fairly high quality data set, but it's very, um, even some of these images are difficult to tell what, what the top label is. So the reason that Carpathy put this together was because he actually wanted to know what is human level performance. Because people were just playing this game and, and back in the, um, like the mid O's, um, people were getting 25% error rate or something. And suddenly in 2012, this image, um, one of the first neural networks things came along and essentially meant a 16% error rate in one loop. And people at the, at the time were improving this by maybe a percent or half a percent a year, so to be completely blown away um, in error terms was, was kind of amazing. So he wanted to find out, since, since people are now getting into single digits, he said, well, what, what is human performance? Let me actually go and label these things myself. And so now, because of what we know what car path low performance is, like 5%. And the reason it's not 100% is a lot of these images are not so obvious. Like this is a pic picture of, I think it's a hot dog, um, but it could be a picture of mustard, depending on, what, on how you look at it, or the bun, or there's a, it could be a meal or something, but there's whole different ways you could label this. And also the image, um, as well as being lots of kind of general objects, there's tons of dogs in there. So they had a whole thing about going for lots of different breeds of dogs, and so that's very fine grained for a human to tell that these things are very good at picking out particular kind of pointy tufts on the ears or something, so it can do the dogs pretty well. So this requires, and now this boosted the complexity of the networks, so Google and Next, this is 2014. Um, so each of these, I showed you a fairly simple CNN before. This is now the kind of depth of the CNNs which were prevalent now three years ago. Not prevalent. This was kind of the winning entry three years ago. Um, oh, but it's now time to play with one of these. So, in your VM, you will find a Google on that. And basically, I'm, well, I can do it in real time. So, if you haven't got a virtual box, then you can't press this virtual box thing. And what I'll do is uh, then import the clients. For this appliance thing, I'll just
could also get an SSH into it. Now you know the user and password. Um, you'll get a console, whatever. There's various things you can have around there. Um, this runs test board as well. It does stuff. But on the other hand, you can't attack your machine host. So you're fine. It's a nice segregated thing. So in here, what we're looking for is this image net. There's a Google run that thing. And you'll see this as being this number three. The image net is Google run that. And what I'm going to do is I, I'm just going to run more. Just I could go, Normally, I would go through this in some detail. Um, because I can, one of the things I've been doing is explaining how these uh, frameworks work. And, and the reason that people can piece together these neural networks so casually now is that people have come up, the open source movement in particular, has produced not just open <coughs> data sets, but these um, frameworks which enable you to just piece these neural networks together and have this whole blame game implemented. And blame game is really um, the derivative chain rule. So basically you can calculate the chain rule through any kind of weird network, um, and the frameworks can take care of this. So, this one's implemented in the thing called Theano, which is a Montreal project. Um, Google thing, or the MXNet, or the CMK. These are kind of newer variants produced by actual, um, well, the research thing is really good, but it's basically a series of kind of duct tape graduate projects. Whereas Google's actually started out, and these other frameworks have started out with a, a much more, uh, a much bigger overview of what's needed, and then actually produced actual engineered so basically, this what this does is it, it loads up some stuff, da, 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 imports the model. There's a model definition here. Um, this is basically the model we're looking at here. Is this? Okay. So this is so this is just a very, rather deep neural network, um, and so this defines some layers, opens this big thing which populates the layers with model predefined model values. There's a way of Preparing an image. This is an image I've got. This image is in the, on the device. Basically, and this is a, this is all you would need to do is to print. Basically, you get the features of the CNN, and then you just say, well, what is the most likely of these classes? Tabby cat. This is a good result. So basically, here we've got a neural network which is fully. Open. This whole thing is open source, so you can go in and have a look. You could play around with it, but one of the disadvantages is you lose the, the ability of your model parameters to be predefined. The nice thing about predefined models is um, you can download these for free, unrestricted, um, but it takes, to do one of these image net things, it can take a month of, of GPU farm to get to a good result. So, worth taking, uh, making use of other stuff. So there's, a, there's other scripts here, so you, which enable you just to drop files into these images into a directory, so it can classify everything it, it sees. So it's got tabby cat, it's got golf ball. This is not the great, I don't think it actually has owl as one of its training examples anyway, so it's the best it can do. Rabbit is probably okay, right? Um, Band-Aid, no, it's, it's, it's been misled somehow. Muzzle Golden Retriever, maybe Siamese cat. So, so this is basically this from 2014, a state-of-the-art thing applied to mean photos I found on the internet. Um, you can play with your own photos, um, whatever. So, uh, but, well, wait, there's more. So, but the thing is that t the next year Google came along with the Inception version three. Now this is a much larger network and is even better performance. There's also a copy, a pre-trained copy of Inception 3 over here. Um, except instead of taking half a second to run or a quarter of a second to run, it's going to take five seconds to run or some some extra chunk of time because there's a lot more ops going on in this. There's a lot more flops that this needs to calculate. And then there's this thing about going deeper and deeper. So if you start back in 2010, we have these comparatively shallow networks. Here's the, this is going forwards in time this way. And this is the performance. So basically, before the deep learning, 
you'll gain 25% errors. This thing came along down to 16 errors. The number of layers is now eight. Eight, 19, so here, 22 layers. So this is the Google and Met, which is sitting 19 layer thing. 22 layer thing, sorry. But most recently, and hats off to Microsoft for doing this, um, now beating human level performance with the 152 layer monstrosity um, called a ResNet, um, which we haven't got on here, but because it would kill everyone's machines, basically. This is a, a really neat idea, and my guess is there will be more neat ideas. This is one of the problems with scoring above human performance is it's very difficult to get any training data. Um, because you, who do you trust to tell you more than human performance? So this is one of the reasons why all of this stuff can, can get up to human level, and can, if you then start to have committees of humans, you can exceed hu a single human, but to beat committees, who do you trust? So that's a problem. Okay, so what we've seen so far is that CNNs are good at images. And hopefully, I persuade you that something so something is interesting. The fact that your machine from you know, zero at the beginning of the hour to now from a Siamese cat is, is pretty amazing. Since it's very difficult to distinguish between a Siamese cat and a tabby cat without talking about stripes and you know, coonage kind of thing, right? Which are very much more abstract human concepts than angles and pixels. So um, these machines can do it's a huge area of research, also a very commercial kind of area of research. Um, CNNs have come along a huge way. Um, so let's, since they're so good, why not use them to do things they were meant to use to be doing? So what I'm gonna, the kind of simple example we're gonna do um, here is speech recognition, which is kind of not what you should be doing with this stuff, but these things are so flexible, why not? So basically what we're going to do is turn speech recognition into an image recognition task and then solve the image recognition task. So on your thing, there'll be a under, there's a folder called speech. And under there, there's a thing called data. And so there, this thing is divided into two pieces. One of which is the thing which prepares the data sets. And this is if you're into any kind of uh, data science, you know that this is the 80% problem. The 20% problem is actually learning to do the thing, but the data collection is a pain. So uh, I have to admit that last weekend, I did not know what I was going to do at all. Um, I was still searching around for some idea for, for what to do. On Monday, I decided, let's try speech recognition. Um, Monday night, I kind of figured out spectrograms, maybe. Um, Tuesday, I was collecting some speech. So what I did is I uh, have a nice little, there's a little app called Voice Recorder on here, which produces web, web files. So basically what, what you can do is let's just, uh, maybe I should just excuse me. So basically when you get a WAV file on your phone, it sounds a bit like <coughs> Sounds a bit like I'm quiet. <coughs> Basically, what, what happens is so I rescale this so you can't see the, the you can't see how bad. So it's the graph package that this scale. Basically, at the beginning, you can see um, this is me fumbling with the phone, and this is me kind of fumbling it the phone out. I want to crop this. This is the digits. So this is uh, my, my version of MNIST for audio recognition. So this is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, fumble. Um, so, so basically, I, I've created a crop tool, which enables you to just crop this thing. And then basically this stuff is, this speech is just a series of num it's an numpy array. It's easy to crop. Um, having done that, you can then save it back. Um, then what I've got is, so this is basically, I'm trying to lay out how this all works. So you can play with this for yourself. You can create your own data. It's all open. It's pretty easy to get, get into. Um, 
what I've got here is a, a range of function which computes a spectrogram. So this takes the sample, takes the mean, da, da, has a Hamming window, FFT, smoothing function. So here is what, what I get with my kind of very naive spectrogram, which is I've got my thing, which is hopefully. So what, what I've done here is, so, so you can see that zero, so this is at the bottom there's low frequencies, but at the top there's high frequencies. This blue line is kind of the amplitude of it, because I want to then crop these into single words. Because rather than take the whole thing as being my image, it's easier to spot the isolated words. So if you're into speech, you're going to know that I'm cheating, I'm going to do this on isolated words, which is so much, more, so much easier than continuous speech. Because if you've got continuous speech, you've got to then figure out where the word boundaries are. Here, I've got a very simple, nicely separated thing. So this is where these other lines come in, this detected silence. And will allow me to do this. So another nice thing you can see, you can see that this is six and eight. I've got two distinct pieces, or several distinct pieces in the thing. Um, five, this is one, two, zero, one, two, three, four, five. You see this little tick symbol, this little tick here? This is the I. Same with this, this is nine. So you can see just from the spectrogram that at this point I'm like, okay, maybe this could work. So I'm greatly encouraged on Tuesday, and then press on. <laughs> so, so I then have this kind of contiguous region detector, which just then slices it up into a nice little bumpy array. And then, oh, yeah, this, is, this is the other thing. I also spend a lot of Tuesday looking around at all the open source database, data sets. It's not so easy in speech because there's a lot of closed data or a lot of non-commercial data, a lot of restricted use. This is why I started doing it on my phone. Um, there are huge data sets, all of which are kind of encumbered. So I couldn't really hand out the USB keys. Um, so this, this thing allows you to collect a fair amount of speech. Um, it's got this idea of having a prefix. So these sentences are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Um, there's some animals which I've got below, but it's kind of extra. Um, and then there's some other things which are kind of interesting. This is the quick brown fox, jump over the lazy dog, is a 26, has all 26 letters of it in English. But the quick beige fox jumped in the air over the thin, each thin dog. Look out, I shout, for he's foiled you again and created chaos. That is every phoneme in the English language in kind of the shortest sentence. So, so this, these would also be really interesting data sets to collect huge numbers of words for, because then you'd have examples of every phoneme in just one sentence. And there's a whole bunch of those. There's other typical data sets called North Wind and Wolf. There's interesting stuff to do. Of course, now I'm down to three days left. Um, there's also, okay, some, some other things I did is there's something great on Bing. So Bing has a very nice um, speech API. So of course, from the speech API, you can get it to say 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Um, creating free data for speech recognition. So thank you, Microsoft. Um, so there's some, some, there's some Bing on here, but you can't get, the, the thing is with this, the open source, so with that, they produce beautiful words, but only one variation. So, um, so now, now I'm going to move on to let's have some um, actual Python speech features. This is an actual package for people who know what they're doing. So this is going to be better. Um, get some isolated words. Here's the nice spectrograms. This is a nicer version of the spectrogram thing. You can see just the same style. But in, because they're proper speech people, they've made the spectrograms look like they correspond to what you hear, rather than what the um, FFTs say. So that's good. And uh, what I wanted to do is I wanted it to look like what you hear because I'm going to do vision on it. So looking like looking right is a good sign for me. So I've got some other code which helps to build a data set. So here, I said this stuff 16 times, or 15 times. 
Um, the House of Queen has contributed um, Catherine, Linda, Raggy, Susan, George, Sarah, and Benjamin, who are actually people from different, well, machine people from different countries. Um, so there's some other data there. Um, then I've got a thing which converts the WAVs to stamps, like the long combined things, combining these into stamps. I've chosen, I'm going to make my stamps look like that. They're all going to be the same size, and so I can then just put a vision process in the pipeline lines. So, oh, so you can see what word this is, because it's called. This is clearly six. Now six is because it's interesting because it's got the six. And it's clear what's going on. And then because it's so clear, this is another good sign, so encouraged. So here's all my sixes. Uh, well, here, here's a bunch of sixes. Um, and then I basically said, well, let's, I also want to have some test data. So I'll keep my test data completely separate. Um, there's a whole, we can see the directory structure. Um, and so here's, here's the digits, what they look like for, for the test data. And now it's time to train a neural network. Um, by the way, there's also some other stuff. Basically, what we're going to do is now train our own CNN to recognise these stamps. I have a label. I have. I don't have much data. I have maybe 20 or 18 different of these stamps. I'm going to try and make it tell the difference. Um, and well, when I when I narrated this to the, the Google guy, which I met, and I said, "Well, I got I got maybe 20 examples, and it's got to train in less than five minutes." He's like. Definitely joking, but that's how that, that was a kind of low point in the week. But, so, so what we've got here is this is the actual definition of the, the CNN. Um, we've got the input features, which is the stamp itself. Um, we then do a convolutional layer. So you can see this is TensorFlow. This is the layers, 2D convolution. Then we do a pooling layer. Then we do another convolution, another pooling. Then we do a dense layer. So this is just the same as the car recognition. In fact, this is. This is just probably 90% is Google's code for doing MNIST, which is a digital recognition thing. Um, we have a dropout layer, which is another exciting advantage, which I can't think of. Um, and then there's the various boilerplate to make as well. Um, so here, so because I said train all, basically this thing has now started processing this stuff and it will gradually you can see the training cycle going on. So it's, got, it's done 1,400 steps. Each step is 20 examples. Picked at random. And you can see that this loss number started at like 2 and is now going down. It jumps around a bit.
basically I have an accuracy of one, which means it guessed all of my digits correctly, which is amazing. But this is from my validation set. Um, let's just see how this stuff works for these predictions. So basically, this is this is from the test set. So this is something he's never seen. On the other hand, it's me speaking, and it's seen quite a lot of me speaking, but it's also got some other voices. I would love to collect voices from around the room and them all into one beautiful data set and then build a multi speaker. I, I'm not sure, I don't even know whether it will do multi speaker. It's possible. Um, and this is this is kind of the, the matrix of this thinks it's 99 percent likely that my zero is a zero. It's not so clear about one. It thinks it could be a, could be a five. Or um, so basically, this is okay. So here's the test set, just illustrating. So this is so we, we've trained this thing. It takes probably three minutes, less than three minutes to train this, having got, got the data. If we trained it more, obviously it, would, it certainly gets better. Um, but there's no time. So. But you can see it's having a reasonable idea of all of, most of these digits. It's got number one, it's a bit confused. This one, okay, this one, it would also get wrong. Um, but here we have, so in, in a nutshell, we have speech recognition um, live on your machines. You can train it. If you just do two rounds or three rounds, this, this will become perfect. Um, there's another interesting thing which and I started to play with, but we haven't got enough time. Basically, we've heard the animals that we like the cat, dog, fox, bird. What you can do is instead of saying, well, I want to have a whole training set on cat, dog, fox, bird, I would let's see what they look like in terms of numbers. I have to say this doesn't look encouraging. But if I feed these words into my numbers neural network, I can see, well, what numbers do these look like? And for instance, bird looks like somewhere between eight and nine, which is kind of weird. Um, but it's, but, but cat, and anyway, so, so you can see that these are kind of got, if you classify them with the wrong thing, you get like a fingerprint. This is a fingerprint of errors, because none of them are the correct answer. But the fingerprint of errors you can then start to train on. So this, you can, you can actually look in more detail by taking logs, looking at the logics of this thing. And you can then train a, an SVM on this thing. Da, da, da. Okay, so, here, so here's the, the answer that it's getting. So I put in some training data as well. So I had, had five cat dog fox birds, which I then used to build my. So I've got only four, five examples of each to train the SVM on the errors. And then I put in a uh, thing. And it's classifying cat, it thinks it's dog. Dog, it thinks it's dog. Fox, it thinks it's fox. And bird, it thinks it's bird. So just training on the errors. It's actually learned to recognize words which it was never taught um, in the initial training. So, so this is a way, another way, not only if we've used CNNs to learn how to do speech recognition, we've ex exploited what we did, a nice train model, to do stuff we never trained in on, which kind of opens the door to why we would use the big CNNs trained for ImageNet to do recognizing of t-shirts, all this kind of other stuff you can do um, just my manipulating uh, you know, known good models. So that covers that and that. Wrap up. There we go. Okay. So deep learning may decide some hype. It's kind of cool what it can do. Um, the field is advancing very rapidly. Um, this is kind of, in, in a way, the CNN thing in, in my mind is kind of fairly done. Um, there's a whole bunch more they can do with speech recognition, but with um, recursive neural networks or recurrent neural networks, you have tree structures, natural language processing, there's a whole lot of interesting stuff to learn. There's a lot of data out there. Um, but having a GPU would be very helpful. Um, and that's kind of one of the reasons that NVIDIA's priced to do this. Um, but you, you'll see from your laptops that you know, you, they'll be sagging. Um, this is all open source. It's called, under my GitHub, it's uh, called Deep Learning Workshop. Please star me if you like it. Um, I should point out there's me and this guy, Sam, are doing a deep learning meetup group called the TensorFlow and Deep Learning Singapore. Um, it's hosted by Google. The next one is Monday. It fills up rather quickly, we found. Um, hopefully, people will abandon us soon. So. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so it's hosted at Google. Um, 
So it's a mix of you know, some TensorFlow, which is one of these big frameworks, and a lot of deep learning, which is kind of the driving factor. Um, we typically want to have three things. We'll have a talk for people starting out. I will probably change this. I will cut it down and make this into a CNN talk for beginners. Um, something from the bleeding edge, which I think can be generated for the serial networks coming up, maybe. We want to do lightning talks so that people can um, show what they like show and tell. We've already had people who've been abusing the models that I made at previous workshops to recognize their family, and it's awesome. So, um, so that meetup.com is where you find that. Um, we're also looking to do a 10-week, like at least 10-week uh, deep learning developer course. Um, this would be, it's like a Udacity kind of course, but actually in person. So the three-hour sessions, we'd have some instruction, but also projects. Because what we see is, as a hiring person, um, when someone comes to me and says, well, I did all these courses at university and we had this project, because it's kind of meaningless. Whereas if you've actually done a project of your own, that means something. So it's like one of the, the, the benefit of people standing up and saying stuff at these open source things is they've actually done something, um, rather than just being shepherded into doing a project. So cost to be decided um, soon. Um, it's not going to be easy. Any questions? <laughs> this is a fun question. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> I have a question, but um, I'm not sure if it makes any sense to me. Uh, you have a question? Yeah, yeah, go, no, go ahead. Things which you'd expect to look at may have not been. Maybe that his 
wife's eyes were particularly round or, or had a, like a necklace on. And it, it loves the necklace, it doesn't care who the person is, but it's going to pick. Or his, you know, his daughter will always tilt her head at a certain angle. Who, who knows what, what it's really doing? You can delve into it, but it's not necessarily what you think the good features. But you know, the fact that you can spot something means it probably will do. Because this book, Inception and Lenin, seem to have certain structure in mm. there. So there were like uh, sets of uh, convolution, dropout, and right, right. pooling layers. Right. And then they have this kind of joint layer where they run these things in parallel. So this is a, also an instance of graduate student descent. In that you have got one guy who figured out that this is a good idea. And he was then employed the next year by Google Sill, right? It's going to be in all, all the networks. So this is where the, the Microsoft thing's good, because the, the ResNet thing, the residual network, which is basically the idea is you have a fairly shallow network, which does a kind of terrible job, and then you kind of fix it up by stuffing in more layers. So basically, you're trying to kill off errors all the time, which is similar to other statistical concepts. So basically, they're, they're then unable to, so instead of training the, 152 layers from, from the get-go. They showed a very small thing and then popped it out. And each stage errors were reducing. Um, so this is the, the 152 is kind of a fake number, but it is the actual number which get, gets executed. So the, the Google thing, they're probably a bit stuck on the, the nice modular structure that they have. It takes someone else to come up to another brutally different idea. Yeah, uh, did you use pre-initialized networks for training or just pre-initialized 
No, it's just random. Form of zero. And also, the data is horribly dirty. I mean, it's like me and my phone. So. <laughs> the thing is, it works. I mean, that's the really encouraging thing. So, yeah. Can you take one more question? Sure, sure. So the, the accuracy is one because I've only got like 20 testing samples or validation examples, right? So either I get them right or wrong. Um, it's like a cross-validation error. So if it gets right, that's 100% correct. Um, it's partly, if I had a huge data set, then I'd have much more fine-grained control. Six gig of data, it all kind of washes out. 